classes series. Some were maybe doing like a book study or something, but even in the process of that, um, lots of application, lots and lots of application comes into play with the messages. Um, and there is application we can always receive from the Word. So I want you to understand that and take that now. There's always application you can receive from the Word and what to do with it. But this series is going to be a very knowledge-based series, if you will. Um, it's one that is prayerfully, hopefully, going to help you learn more scriptures, learn why certain churches make stances that they do on things that are totally true. They're making stances on truth, but also have to understand why it may be easy to miss certain other parts of the truth. <coughs> and then you can put it all together. So some of you that are note takers, you're going to be happy to go on this. Um, some of you that aren't note takers, good luck. Um, you ready to mark your Bible or something. Uh, those of you that get behind, there's certain points I can always show you in my notes, or you can always go back and we'll put it online. Because we put it online within 24, 48 hours. It's usually online. Um, but this series, I'm really excited about it. Because I love just the knowledge base of it. I love preparing you guys. Some of you, I mean, you guys are all high school, um, but there's going to be a point where, you know, freshmen just in a little over three years, um, unless you stay here, you may be out here to look around the church at a college, when you're in college. And, you know, seniors, when you graduate, the same thing. When you are, if you're going away to college, you will be looking for a church home in that place, you know, wherever you're at. And in that process, you don't want to just go just wherever, and, oh, well, they're saying some things that sound like truth, so I'll just take that in. You want to make sure what the full truth is, what the full package really is. You want to make sure you have that base. And so I want to do that. Tonight, we're actually going to talk about evangelism. Tonight's approach with the churches is on evangelism. There are churches that will preach to you and teach to you that it is absolutely a person's responsibility. To get saved. It's all about themselves. There are other churches that are going to tell you that it is our job to go out and do all the witnessing, all the evangelism, and it's all on us. The responsibility, the burden is on us. And then there's other churches that preach that it's neither of those. It's just God's job. The scripture I'll use in a little bit, and I may come to the Father, but the Spirit draws him. There are churches that will just say, Lack of a better way to work, it's kind of a Calvinistic approach, if you will. But they have this belief system of they're predestined to become believers, so it really has nothing to do with whether they really want to be or not, or whether or not you share with them or not. It has nothing to do with either one of those points. All those points that I just brought up are based in Scripture. So I want you to follow me here. When I begin to preach this in just a moment, and I begin to get after it, I want you to understand that, for example, the first one I'm going to bring to you is about personal responsibility. That it is someone's personal responsibility to get saved. It has nothing to do with anybody going to evangelize it. It has nothing to do with God. It has to do with their own responsibility. I want you to understand that I'm going to attack that as though that's the only way. So understand that. And then I'm going to bring to you the it's our job. You with me? And it'll make it look like it's really not even about the person's responsibility or about God. But our job. And then when I get to the ex God's job alone, I'm going to go after that for you. Like that's, because the thing is, is, all these things are based on solid truth in the scriptures. Which we'll get that at the end and we'll come back to Ryan. Go with me. Go with me. All right. So, first things first. We're going to talk about personal responsibility. Because if someone is going to find Jesus, it is up to them. Romans 10, 9, and 10. Let's just open the Bibles right there to that. This is a very familiar verse that we use a lot when it comes to preaching the Word of God, and about somebody coming to make a decision for Christ. Romans 10, 9, and 10 say that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. First thing, you can't make, you see, it's with your heart you believe, it's with your mouth you confess do you know that you can't make anybody confess with their mouth in all spirit and truth that they want Jesus to be their Savior and Lord? Do you know that? And you see churches that will bring down all these tons of kids or whatever, and they're just like, okay, I'll, I'll get it saved now, right now, we're going to pray over you, and boom, you're saved. How do we know that they really understood what that meant? To confess with their mouth Jesus as Lord. 
to believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. How do we know when they did? Well, the issue is you can't make anybody decide. You can evangelize all day. You can't make anyone decide. You can't make Haley profess Jesus as her Savior and Lord. That's up to her. That's on her. Do you guys understand that? And doesn't Romans 10 on instant say that? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So with that personal responsibility, I mean, i got to ask you guys even for real. If you haven't come to that moment, you've kind of done through whatever, but you kind of let others be your faith for you. If you've never come to a point in your life, well, straight up, you have not confessed him as your, as your Lord. You may believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, but you've never confessed Jesus as your Lord and given him that lordship of you. If you've never done that, guess what? That's on you. And if you want to be a Christ follower, guess who has to do that? Guess who has to do that? You do. I can't do it for you. Your mom and daddy can't do it for you. You've got to do that for you. And then Jesus, actually in Luke chapter 9, he gets even more just, boom, laying it out on it. In Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57, I'm going to go 57 to 62 to the end of that chapter. So Luke 9, 57 to 62. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. Please let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, No one who puts his hands in the plow and looks back is fit for service to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus calls it out that you're going to make no excuses. When you come to that moment in your life, when you're willing to say, I want him to be my Lord and my Savior, Luke 9, 57, 62, this is the thing. You get, they're walking along the road, you guys. Do you see this? They're walking. It's not Jesus. Jesus is not telling them parable. Okay? This is Luke. Right there in the process of this watching, he's going, walking down the road. This is going on. Okay. There's real life action. And this man comes up, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And just like, guess what? We have no blessing there. You don't know where you're going to be at the end of the day when you're following me. All you know is you're with me. You follow. Do you understand? All you know is you're with me. And guess what? You have to choose. Am I willing to lose all my security of worldly and earthly things, worldly and earthly comforts? Am I willing to lose all that to be with Jesus? Does Jesus matter more than my earthly desires and comfort? Does he, does, does he mean more to me than that? Guess what? I can't make you make that call. I can want you to. Kelsey, I can look at you and go, baby, go, come on. Come on now, for real. Quit hanging on to those comforts. Come on. Quit hanging on to those comforts. But who has to let go of those comforts? Who does? Kelsey does. I can't make her let go of those things. That's on her. As he continues down, he's going, man, this other man, he says to another man, Jesus, let's do another. Hey, follow me. Come on. And the man replies, Lord, first let me go back to my father. Just so you understand traditions, that doesn't mean dad was dead. So it's not like Jesus is going, he just died? <laughs> Forgive him. Come on, he's already gone. Come on, Barry. That's not what's happening here. He's saying, first we go back and let the dead bury their own dead. He's like, that time is going to come. You come on. This man was leaning back on a tradition. On a tradition. What Jesus said here is, you can't go off of tradition. You want to follow me? You got to put traditions aside. Why? Let's think about this. The Pharisees. The Pharisees had laid out all kinds of traditions. They had taken the word that God had spoken to them, and they had twisted things left and right and left and right, and formed all these traditions of religion, traditions of their culture. And Jesus is saying, "Uh, -uh. you want to follow me? You got to lay down your traditions." You think that this has to be this way because your little traditional whatever says it's got to be that way? 
Guess what? I may not say it's that way. Which one are you going to lean on? Me? Or what your worldly tradition, religious tradition said? Which one are you going to lean on? And then, he brings in that one more, where the guy's like, hey, I'll follow you, Lord, but first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replies, um, no one who puts his hand in the plow looks back to the kingdom. Here's this guy going, hey, let me go back and just, let me just say bye. I'm not even worried about staying until my dad dies. Let me just go say bye to the fam. And Jesus is saying, let's go. Here's the imperative on this one. It's now. It's now. <clears throat> don't be going back and trying to get your house in order and then follow me. Think about this. Truth. You don't go to the doctor when you're feeling well, right? It's going to the doctor when you're sick. You follow what I'm saying? You know, I want to go to the doctor, but I'm really not feeling well, so I'm going to wait until I feel better than I go to the doctor. Isn't that absolutely stupid? You know what I'm saying? So it's like, no. You go to the doctor when you're sick. Like, now. Like, let's go. And Jesus is saying, it's now. Now. You come with me now. But ultimately, who has to be the one to make that decision? To follow Jesus right then and there. You do. You follow. And even then, go back and look a little bit to Luke 9, 23, just back a few verses. Then he says to them all, okay? He says to them all, I'm with Peter and all them. It's all after they've done the whole feeding of the 5,000, all this, whatever. Jesus brings up this point. He goes, hey, if anyone, verse 23 of chapter 9, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If anyone's going to follow me, what do they have to do? They've got to take up their cross, right? They've got to deny themselves, right? They've got to choose to follow, right? Hear me with this. I think a lot of times, a lot of people, they lean on everybody else for their salvation. They lean on everybody else for their walk with the Lord. And that's definitely very even American. Who's that up-and-coming speaker that we want to go listen to in their podcast? And, oh, wait, this person's going to preach at that event? I'm going there because I want to hear them preach. Or I want to have, I'll sing or whatever, but they're leading worship? Oh, I'm going to that. What? We kind of do that same thing. We worship different things, but we don't really worship and focus on Jesus and his word. But at the end of the day, you've got to make that decision to choose to do that. But so much we lean on this person to lead me to Jesus, this person to hold my faith, this person, this person, this person. What would happen if I was out the door tomorrow? See, that's happened before. That was a time where there wasn't somebody leading and shepherding. And there were some guys that they were at a disciple now and they told one of the leaders, they said, you know, these are upper classmen guys. And these guys said, Man, we just want to have to live in how we need to be living because we didn't have anybody leading us. We just didn't know what to do. And the leader looks at him and says, Did you not have this? Did you not have the Bible? See, I'm here to help you understand Scripture. I'm here to try to spur you on to love and good deeds. I'm here to encourage you in your faith and build you up and help you get wiser in your knowledge and all that. I'm here for that purpose, but guess what? I can't be your faith. Pastor Barry can't be your faith. That podcast person can't be your faith. Jesus has to be your faith, and that's up to you. That's 100% up to you. And the cool thing for me is i got to wash my hands of that and say, sweet, because if you start screwing up and you start to choose whatever choices you want to choose, well, that's not that's your personal responsibility. So I'm good. I'm good. Do you guys follow what I'm saying? And I can base everything I just said how I just said it. That's straight out of the Word. That's straight out of the Word. But we see there's another argument. This is the our job. Our job. If you go to, I'm going to start soft and they'll come back, so scriptures might be a little bit out of order. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Very familiar verse. A lot of y'all know this, especially those that have gone on the missions. In Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and show them with you always to the very end of the age. See how Jesus is like, hey, it's your responsibility. You go out and make disciples. Who commanded this? Who commanded this? Jesus did. Now hold up. Then people with the personal responsibility, you're hearing even Jesus saying, hey, any man wants to come at me, he must take up his own cross. He must deny himself. You follow what I'm saying? Jesus said, oh, you go out and you tell them about Jesus. You tell them about God. You witness to them. That's actually not on them. That's on you. Who, who has the authority to tell us that? Jesus. Jesus had the authority to say that. You go witness, and you go make disciples. Now that he says in Acts 1, 8, that I believe we have that one too as well. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. And Judea and Samaria. He's like, I'm going to give you power. I'm not just telling you to go do it. I'm going to empower you to go do it. Why? Because it is your job. Olivia, it is your job to go out and testify faith. It's not up to the other people. It's up to you. Then you get reference back to the Old Testament. Some of y'all are not going to like, you think I'm not preaching this sermon or from this passage from Ezekiel? Let me just tell you, some of y'all be sweating if I was. But I'm just going to read you the scripture and talk about it for a minute. Ezekiel 3, starting in verse 16. Really listen to what he's saying. He's about to get up in, in your business. Luke 3, 16. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die. And you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life. That wicked man will die for his sin. And I will hold you accountable for his blood. Hello. Okay, it didn't say hello. I was a little bit issue. Verse 19. But if you warn the wicked man and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, well, he'll die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. Verse 20. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before him, he will die. Since you did not warn him, he will die for his sin. The righteous things he did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the righteous man not to sin, and he does not sin, he'll surely live because he took warning, and you will have saved yourself. Okay, so follow me in this passage. First thing, he's talking about a wicked man. Basically, in the reference of that wicked man, he's talking about somebody that is not a Christ follower. You follow? He's talking about somebody who is not one of God's people. In our New Testament day, on the side of the cross, it's a Christ follower. He's not talking about a Christian. He's talking about a wicked man. What he's saying is, they're going to die in their sin. Do we know that? If, you're, if you are living in sin, if you're not a Christ follower, basically you are dead in your sin. Right? We know that. And if you don't go share your faith with them and say, hey, we need to talk. You don't do this. When they die, this is straight right there. He goes, verse, verse 18, when I say look at you should have died, you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life. That would be made of God for his sin, and I will hold who accountable? I will hold who accountable? That's not somebody else's responsibility. That is straight up yours. <clears throat> you catch that. I will hold you accountable for his blood. Do you catch that? That's on you. If there's a lost person out there that you're not sharing Jesus with, and you know they're lost, it's not like you got to go like hunt down. You know, if you know somebody's lost, and you're not sharing faith with them, Finding a way to open that conversation and earn that right to speak Jesus' love to them, tell them about the gospel, that blood is on you. And the cool thing for me is, I'm actually exempt from this, because I'm not exempt in this sense. If you want to get mad about this, take it up with your daddy. Because this is not my word, this is his. He will hold you accountable for the blood. But, if you do, warn him. You're sinning, you're going to go burn in hell. He didn't turn. I don't know why. I came from the love of Jesus. Yeah, try again. Alright? Not that. But, if you really try, if you do warn the wicked man, he doesn't turn from his wickedness or his evil ways. He'll die for his sins, but 
You will have saved yourself. You will have done what you were called to do. You will have done your job, because it is your job to go tell. When that righteous man, the righteous one, comes up, see, now we're talking about Christ followers, and this side of the cross, we're talking about Christ followers. When that righteous man's going into sin, yeah, they're going to barely skate by. They're guaranteed their salvation. That's whatever. They're going to skate by. You know what I'm saying? And they're going to be held accountable for things. There is an accountable. There is a judgment seat that happens. And there is. But if you step up, if you don't step up to that righteous man, okay, the righteous things he did will not be remembered, and I will hold who accountable for his blood? Who am I going to hold accountable? You. You. So whose job is it to get out there and open your mouth? Whose job is it to go show the love of Jesus Christ? Yours. And you can't get, Jesus commanded it in Matthew 28. Acts chapter 1, Jesus empowers you. From Ezekiel, the same truth is there. We're still hearing, yeah, I'm holding it on you if you don't do something about it. Jesus would not have commanded us to do it if there wasn't an accountability to have to do it. You follow? Jesus would never have held us accountable to do it or commanded us to do it if there was no accountability to it. Because if he would have like, yeah, you get time, share it. If not, that's cool. But if you get time, you often can make disciples of all nations. No, that's not what he said. He said, go. Go. It's on you. I like Romans 10. Go back to that, which we're using for the other one, but hey, bring it back around to this one, though. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 14. And here he says, How then can they call on one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. How are they going to know? How can we expect a lost person to know who Jesus Christ is if we keep our mouth shut? Does that make sense? You can't look at that in any form or fashion of that is somebody else's responsibility. It's their personal responsibility to find Jesus. They can't find who they don't know about. Do you call them? They can't find who they don't know about. you got to tell them. you got to tell them. Just because I'm wearing a wedding ring, you may not know whether or not I have a wife. You may think it because I'm wearing a ring, but really, in today's day and age, everybody wears jewelry all up on their hands, whatever, so it doesn't matter. Okay? But you're going to know I have a wife when I talk about my wife, which I talk about her all the time. She's hot, why not? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm blessed, all right? She's awesome. She's smarter than I could ever imagine to be. All right? She's amazing. I will talk about her. But how will you know if I ever bring it up? You can think, well, there's, I see something on his hand, like, but I think there's somebody, but I've never seen, I don't know. Kind of like, well, I've seen him wear t-shirts that, like, have some kind of Bible verse on it that I don't really know. You follow what I'm saying? We have to use our mouth. We've got to speak it. You can't go... I go to Christian church to school, so that's not testifying about Jesus. That is a form of testifying, let's be real, but you got to make sure your actions and your words back up what you wear. Does that make sense? And by the way, let's not be so narcissistic to think that everybody knows exactly what shirt you're wearing. You don't know, you remember that shirt I was wearing the other day? It told you all about Jesus. That's making the assumption. Didn't you pay total attention to me and look at me? Well, just so you know, you're probably going to feel really stupid and they go, nope. Yeah, let's not be narcissistic and set yourself up, okay? It's not all about you. Speak about who the one it really is about. You follow. You follow. Okay, so hear me in this. It is our job to go out and testify because they can't believe if they don't hear. They can't believe if they don't hear. So we got to go speak it. So what do we do with that? What do we do with the fact there are so many people out there that believe it's up to somebody else? Like, it's up to, like, 
Connor to have to find Jesus himself. It's his personal responsibility, so he's on his own. See ya. I don't have to evangelize. But see, what are you doing on the other side of that? When you're hearing all this, it is your responsibility, Becca, to get out there and show the love of Jesus Christ and speak the love of Jesus Christ so people can come to Jesus Christ. It is your job. Well, then all of a sudden, it almost starts to become more about us. And so the third part of this, which is why Calvinists are able to go there off the day. And this is what they said off the scripture. John 6, verse 44. John 6, verse 44. Here's what the word says. No one comes to me. This is Jesus answering. No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I'll raise him up on the last day. No one comes to me unless the Spirit draws him. Do you catch that? What does that do with somebody's personal responsibility? How can somebody be personally responsible to come, personally responsible to, come to Jesus if they can't come unless the Spirit draws them in. And really, how can it really be up to you, Thomas, to go share Jesus with somebody if, well, they're not going to come unless the Spirit of God draws them in anyway? So why waste your breath? You follow. You follow. Not just that. Romans 8 so still back in Romans. Talk about some different things kind of come out of the same book. Romans 8, same letter. Romans 8, verses 28 to 30. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, predestined, we'll come back to that, to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he will also glorify. Predestined means determined in advance. In other words, by how that sounds, does it not sound? Predestined, determined in advance. In other words, before the dawn of time, before you were here, God already determined whether or not you were going to be one of his own that are called or not. Do you follow it says it right there, guys. It says it right there in Romans chapter 8. Those he predestined. He called, he justified, he glorified. Those he predestined. Don't lose sight of this. In Psalm 139. We know that Psalm 139. We're not going to go there right now, but Psalm 139 is going to talk about how you're fearful and wonderfully made. And all your days were ordained before one of them ever came to be. That would easily make it feel like and think there are people that are just destined. But they're going to go to hell and there's nothing you can do about it. If all their days were ordained before one of them came to be. Well, one was eight. Because he's predestined. Call. If you call to justify those who justify him, glorify You follow him. Guys, it's biblical. It's biblical truth. It'll all come together. Hang on. Ephesians 1 goes more into that. Ephesians chapter 1 goes more into that. Starting in verse 3. <clears throat> Verses 3 to 10. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us, here we go, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us, predestined, determined in advance, predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Hello. Catch this. Choosing to be holy and blameless. You guys, there's a big issue here. But I want you guys to understand this. 
There are churches. They stand on. You have been predestined to become a Christ follower or not. And they preach it with passion. And when they're singing, on top of the God and Father that we all worship. Just like the ones who tell you it's all about you doing it. Just like the ones who tell you, forget whether or not you do it, except they didn't really come up, come up with it all on own. God can draw them. But does that mean they have to choose to surrender? Hello. God can draw them. But does that mean they'll automatically surrender to his call? Do you hear this? God drawing them? Does that mean they're going to immediately go, oh, well, then yes, I'll, you can be my Lord. Does that mean that? Because how many times has God tried to speak to you or call you to something, and you said, no, thank you. I am saved, but no, thank you. I don't want to do that, actually, because I have a heart set on something else. Oh, enter back to Luke 9, 57 to 62. Hello. You follow. I want you guys to get this with evangelism. It is all three pieces. <laughs> don't be mistaken about that. I'm going to tie all these verses together here for you real quick. Just with Ephesians chapter 1, there's something else in there. I want you to understand it with evangelism. <clears throat> It is absolutely up to the individual to choose whether or not they want to come to Christ. They have to choose to surrender. Understand that. Understand that. They have to choose to surrender. They have to choose to obey His Lordship. Just like we as Christ followers have to choose that all the time. We're called to love, and how many times do we choose not to love? We talked about that in the Walking In series. We just have to choose to obey Choose to follow, but a lost person. You can't make them come to Christ. It is up to them to make that choice. So do know that. If they don't make that choice, that's not on you. If you've done what you've been called to do. I think I said this story one time. I'll never forget it at a camp. We'd gone to a camp. Um, Jenna's soccer coach, one of her coaches, right before that summer, when the season ended, we had talked, and I was like, yeah, I'll help out in the fall with the team. This dude was amazing, amazing guy. Um, I'll help out with you in the fall, and yada, yada, yada. Got to know him, good buddies, he's great. And I felt in my heart, when we were going into this party, the end of the season party, and I really need to really just, I really need to share Jesus with him. I need to share Jesus with him. I felt that burden on my heart so bad. So let me tell you what I did. I was so stupid. Oh, I was. I looked at him. He's like, what are you doing this summer? I was like, I'm going to be going to like youth camps. I'll make a couple mission trips. I'm going to be doing it. It's kind of cool, you know. So what are you going to be doing this summer? And I looked back to him. That was the end of my any form or fashion of Jesus conversation, by the way. That night. And in my mind, I semi-justified myself. I told him I was going to go to youth camp on mission trips. <clears throat> and I left it there. Got a call on a Thursday night at youth camp. And it was all I could do to finish function that night. He'd been in a bad motorcycle wreck and died. Do you know the one thing that flashed in my face when I heard that? Did I not tell you to share Jesus with me? And our God is a loving God. He brings <laughs> grace. Cool thing is, is when the funeral happened, absolutely, I'm asking questions to people that do him even better or closer to family. Apparently, he had received Christ at a younger age. Praise God. Hey man, I was talking down that. I was like, please. But can I tell you that my heart was like, God, whenever you prick my spirit to say you need to talk to somebody, God, don't ever let me disobey you again. And don't ever let me justify it by talking about how I'm doing a churchy thing. See, guys, we all have that issue at times. 
where we try to back away from speaking what we know is true and sharing that grace. Would it have been his responsibility to accept Jesus if he didn't know Jesus? Is it his responsibility? Yes. So his call like the Lord. Say, I want to. What's the deal with this predestined business then? What is the deal with this predestined business? If God chooses certain people, does he not choose others? God desires that the whole world will be saved through Jesus Christ. How much of the world? The whole world. When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. The debt has been paid. The debt, the debt for everybody has been paid. The issue of somebody needing forgiveness for their sins, done, handled. We miss that so often. The debt has been paid. Jesus said it. It's finished. It's finished. <coughs> now I'm talking about a lordship issue. Follow. A surrendering to him issue. Who did he predestine to want to be with him? Everybody. Now, does he know the choices you're going to make? Did he know Judas was going to turn around and turn on Jesus? Even though he was one of the twelve? He knew. He straight up knew. Did that work out in part of the plan that got Jesus to the cross? Yeah. Could Judas have turned? Absolutely. When Jesus... I mean, when Jesus was in there washing his feet, I don't know how Judas sat there and let him wash the feet. But I was about to betray you, and here you are serving him like that. But then he says, what you're going to do, do it quickly. Even in that moment, Judas should have been like, he knows. Oops. Kind of like, your parents are like, you know that you're up to no good, you're up to some funny business, Hayden. And your mama looks at you and says, all right, Hayden, whatever you're going to do, go do it. What's your idea? <laughs> abort, abort, abort now, abort. Right? Because you're thinking, they know. You know? They know. And Judas, what does he do? He goes and does it. He had so many times to turn. And when he went up to Jesus in that garden, and he kissed him in the garden, when he gave him that kiss on that cheek, that brotherly greeting, that brotherly, intimate friend greeting, how can he kiss the side of Jesus, who he's walked with for three years? Don't tell me in that moment he didn't feel something going on inside. Yeah, that's probably why all that turmoil, why I probably ended up killing himself. I love him. That's probably why. Did Jesus want to have a full relationship with him? Absolutely. But did he let him play out the role that he wanted to play? No. Yeah. Catch this in Ephesians 1. After those verses 3 through 10, check out 11 and 14. <clears throat> kind of the rest of the story, if you will. In him, we were also chosen. Hello. In him, we were also chosen. Having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will, what I just talked about, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be praised for his glory. And you who were included in Christ, you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation. <laughs> and having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. Here's the deal. You that heard the truth, you that received the truth, hey, you were brought into that also. God's chosen people, the Israelites, yeah, they weren't the only ones that got to have a taste of this. They weren't the only ones to come in. Not in the Old Testament and not in the New. But see, in the New, the bell's thrown away. We all get coming. You hear what I'm saying? We all get coming. So I want you guys to grab this. Don't forget any of this. A person does have to choose. But you still have to go tell. You still have to go tell. Regardless, God draws his people. If somebody doesn't come to Christ, that's on them. But you try. You share. You share. And if somebody, you're sharing, and they seem soft, but there's some, understand that when you're sharing Christ with somebody, there will be spiritual warfare. Why? The enemy does not want them to come to Christ. It's the last thing he wants. He can care less about them before they come to Christ. But if they're about to come to Christ, I guarantee you there's going to be spiritual warfare because that's the last thing he wants. Man, I'll say this to the first other. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. 
But against the rulers and the principalities, this dark forces of the world, man, our battle is against the enemy, Satan. It's not against people. So when you're out sharing faith, I promise you, the enemy's going to come after you. He may use all kinds of forms and fashions to do it. He's going to come after the one you're sharing faith with because he doesn't want them to know Jesus. Trust God's spirit to do that one. You may just be planting seeds. Guess what? Plant dead seeds, baby. Plant dead seeds. God will do the work. Make sure it's God's seed that you're planting, not your seed. Hello? Make sure it's God's seed that you're planting, not your seed. And let God do the work. But God's spirit, trust God's spirit. And if God tells you to go talk to somebody, there's a reason God wants you to talk to somebody. I promise you. They may not receive Christ, they may walk away going, why did I have to go share Christ with them? They didn't want him. How do you know that you didn't tell them something that God was setting up for them that is going to come back to play a day, a week, a month, a year, ten years later? You don't know. Guess what? That's not on you. That's not about you. They're not coming to faith in him. It's about them coming to faith in Jesus. We're right. God's with evangelism, there's all kinds of stories that get told. And every one of those things, some of those seem like they contradict each other. Guess what? None of that contradicts each other. Because it's all together. It all goes together. But you know that there are churches that just want you to believe one thing. Know why we believe what we believe. To take the whole picture, not just a glimpse of the picture. Does that make sense? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love. God, thank you so much for your truth. Father, I pray that you would, Father, that you would guide us to people that we can share faith with. God, you don't even work on their hearts now to receive the message, to hear the message. That your spirit would already be drawn. Father, I pray that you would help us have the courage to speak about who you are, to share your gospel our words and our actions. And the Father, that our lives will show what it's like to take the responsibility of you as our Lord. Not letting anything get in the way of showing that you have the true lordship of our life. Let our lives testify that. No people, no traditions, no personal desires getting in the way. It's about you. For your glory. We know you be destined. God, you be destined. We want everybody to know. Thank you that you are such a loving, gracious Father. Help us to take your word, take all of your word, not just bits and pieces. But you be the truth that God's on us. Thank you that you gave us Jesus. Thank you that you gave us your Holy Spirit so we can understand your word. And we receive Jesus. So God is in prayer. Amen. Love to meet it. Have a good night. Take away tomorrow.